Welcome to episode 15 of the Exit Philosophy Podcast. I'm Scotty Mack, Scott MacArthur. That is Rich Griffin. Griff, and I guess the way I introduced us, I assumed you're watching on youtube.com slash exit philosophy, uh, but you are also listening wherever you get your podcasts. And before we bring Griff on, it's a great time uh, to lead things off by reminding you that you can get the entire catalog of Griff's work at Griff's The Pitch. Dot com multiple weekly Blue Jays and MLB columns, a weekly MLB power rankings column. And those become more interesting and more important at this time of year because we're into the final six or seven weeks of the regular season. Griff also has exclusive conversations with some of the game's current and former greats featuring a lot of Blue Jays, both past and present, and a lot of the great former Montreal Expos names that you remember so well and love. And you can also get the Exit Philosophy podcast linked to griffsthepitch.com. It is Monday morning, August the 14th, as I sit here in Brookside, Nova Scotia. Griff is back in Oakville, Ontario. What's up, sir? I don't know. Just when you said August the 14th, that reminded me that in 1968, the Montreal Expo's ownership made the first payment, $100,000 they gave to the National League to become officially a franchise. After being granted the franchise in May, I think it was May 28th, uh, it took them that long to figure out where they were going to play and whether they were going to play in Montreal. And they settled on Jerry Park, and the rest is history. A $100,000 down payment. That's and it. it. 55 years later, Griff, it's $100,000 for a head of lettuce at the grocery store. <laughs> Talk about inflation. That's right. right. I yep. mean, uh, everything everything has gone way, way up in price. So we, we got to deal with a lot of things today. The good, the bad, and everything in between from the week and weekend that was. We'll shelve the bad or the kind of sort of bad until a little bit later on, which was the Blue Jays' performance against Cleveland and the Chicago Cubs. And we'll start with, I actually think it's a major understatement to suggest it was only the good, Jose Bautista's weekend. Uh, hang on, before we get there, I want to find out about your setting, about you being in a fourth different place in a fourth oh. consecutive week, and are you ever going to be settled? I'll be settled in like three weeks. So I'm at, I want to give a shout out actually to Rob and Penny McIsaac, really good friends who have put me up for the remainder of the month of August because my initial arrangements for this month went kerplunk uh, pretty quickly. Brookside, uh, Nova Scotia is south of Halifax. And just for a mental picture for you, I could best describe it as being on the way to Peggy's Cove from Halifax. And there's about a 45 minute drive Halifax to Peggy's. So um, Prospect Cove might be a name that some people are familiar with, uh, maybe not, uh, but I, I'm not that far from Prospect Cove. It's beautiful down here. It's about 15 minutes to the nearest grocery store. So we are, as they say, out of town, uh, but I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, Griff, Friday night, at the garrison grounds of Citadel Hill. So if you've been to Halifax, you know the Citadel. It's the beacon of the the city, the city on a hill. The Great Outdoors Comedy Festival kicked off for the weekend. Bill Burr was here on Sunday, but Jerry Seinfeld headlined Friday night. And you and, went. And I had never seen Jerry live my brother and my parents had seen Jerry at Massey Hall more than 20 years ago, and I was the black sheep of the family, as I typically am, uh, but for that reason as well. I was the black sheep who had never seen Jerry. And Uncle Shawnee, if you remember the Scott MacArthur show on TSN oh, yeah. 1050, my old producer, Sean Levine, Rob and Penny, Sean's girlfriend, Lynn, a bunch of us went, and we sat on the downward slope of the hill directly facing the stage and we watched a couple of awesome warm-up acts and then jerry came on and gave us about 70 minutes of his best stuff some new some 
really old. Uh, you may remember one of the episodes. I, I don't know if it was the Donna Chang episode, <laughs> but there was one of his stand-up bits at the start of an episode of Seinfeld in the mid-90s was about the Chinese hanging on to the chopsticks, even though the fork has been invented. He did, he did go there. He did go there. Uh, but it was 70 minutes. And when I tell you, like, Jerry's my comedy hero, that's an understatement. So the fact that at he's and he's not a kid anymore. It feels like he is because we loved his show. But his show was on a long time ago now, which also says something about us. Jerry turns 70 next year in 2024. So to be able to say that I saw him understanding that he's on the back end of his career, fitting that in and doing so on a cloudless night in comfortable temperatures on a hill in Halifax, Nova Scotia, outdoors. Friggin' amazing, man. It, I'll, I could talk about this for days. Yeah, and, and, you know, people wonder why we watch Seinfeld whenever it's on in syndication over and over, and I've seen that show. You've seen every show. Well, nobody asks when you listen to Dark Side of the Moon for the thousandth time. Yeah. You know, what's the difference? It's, it's yeah. art. Art for art's sake. Yeah. By the way, by the way, yeah. Griff, have you ever done Dark Side of the Moon? You start the album at the third MGM Lions roar for the Wizard of Oz, and you let the album just roll <laughs> and watch the movie. It helps. If you're on some hallucinogens, I was going to say that that sounds like a specific moment. But, <laughs> but I'm not going to say it doesn't suck, or I'm not going to say it sucks. It's the opposite. It's a good thing, as I struggle to get my words out. But yeah, well, you mentioned Dark Side of the Moon. That's where I had to go with that one. Well, that being said, let's get on to the weekend with uh, Jose Bautista, which was a bright side of the weekend for the Blue Jays. I, uh, you know. People who know me know that I love to nitpick or for the sake sometimes of playing devil's advocate, I will, I will do so. Although I will never do so if I don't believe in what I'm saying. That ceremony, that ceremony, Griff, is legitimately one of the best moments in Blue Jays franchise history. Uh, I, the Joe Carter home run, there've been a lot of on-field moments. LMR's homer off Eckersley in 92, Carter's home run, Bautista's bat flip, Edwin's walk off in the 2016 wild card game against Baltimore. Like we can go on and on down the list of on-field moments, but in terms of what it means to be an elite member of this near half century old franchise, and in terms of what that individual, Jose Bautista, meant to this team, I think what went down on Saturday was as good as it gets. And as I tweeted in a somewhat tacky way, I gave it a 19 out of 10. Well, to me, what made it so special and so genuine was the fact that the crowd was into it. They were, they were legitimately into honoring jose bautista and not just for the bat flip but the bat flip moment was replayed over and over and that's the moment that people really fell in love with jose bautista and some would say with the toronto blue jays but it was a genuine reaction of the crowd and forty nine thousand, whatever it was forty two thousand people i'm not sure um and then the other thing was the genuine reaction of his teammates who showed up. And for you, one of those teammates or a couple of them made it special when you were watching. Yeah, I, I mean, Edwin's the obvious one. Um, but like, I don't think it was a state secret that Jose Bautista and Edwin Encarnacion were and are close friends. Right. But but when you look at the wide range of people who showed up for this thing, like Justin Smoke, who is legitimately one of the easiest going, 
nicest athletes I've ever co covered. I, I don't know how you feel about that, Griff. I mean, he's a terrific guy. But Justin Smoke showed up in Toronto looking, I would argue, to save his career, right? It, it had not worked out in Seattle, and he had – had he Excellent. been the get? Let me don't let me get this wrong. He was essentially the centerpiece going to Seattle of the trade that sent Cliff Lee to the Rangers from the Mariners, right? Okay. Or am I? Yeah. No, I believe you're right on that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if I, but like, so Smoke was this up and coming first baseman and just didn't really land on his feet in Seattle at any point. And it wasn't a hit right out of the gate in Toronto. I mean, he lost playing time to Chris Colabello. Um, and then when Colabello had all his issues, Smoke stepped in and and really started to turn things around and became a stalwart. The fact that Justin Smoke was there, that signaled something to me. The fact that Ryan Goins was there, never more than a utility player, although I would argue played his best baseball in the month of September 2015 when he started to take some walks, hitting at the bottom of the order, gave you great defense up the middle, like Ryan Goins, I know all their flights were paid for, but wanted to come in and 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 support his old teammate. Ricky Romero, who was not there for the mid-2010s heyday, but was there in the earlier part of Jose's tenure in Toronto, was there when as a rookie in 2009 when Jose was finding himself, and then 2010 and onward. John Gibbons, like the wide swath of personalities and backgrounds and types of players or managers slash coaches, the scout that found them and signed them to the pirates, the clubhouse guys, Moose and Kevin Malloy, like everybody wanted to be there. And I think that's the greatest testimony to somebody, both as a player and a person. Well, just to follow up on that. Yeah. The, the crowd reaction, I mean, it wouldn't have been the same without the crowd reacting to every announcement, to every video, to every introduction, um, you know, and then in the evening to see King Felix in Seattle being honored and going into their Hall of Fame, the difference in ceremonies and the difference in crowd reaction was unbelievable. The highlight of, of King Felix was sitting on a throne with a looking like a margarine king or something, you know, and Adrian Beltre surprising him showing up. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it, just the the contrast between those two ceremonies made the Blue Jays um, sort of forget about losing to them in the wild card last, uh, <laughs> or maybe not. But well, now that you bring it up, maybe not. <laughs> to me, it was interesting to see the the levels of reception that the crowd gave as each person was introduced on the red carpet. Uh, and brought out to the field and to me the uh the biggest ovations and in no particular order were john gibbons cito gaston edwin paul beeston who came right after edward rogers and mark shapiro and and beeston's reception was outstanding but the the fifth one and you mentioned it before like how does ryan goins get so popular <laughs> It, that he's in that group, you know, like he's a 210 or 220, whatever he is, career hitter. And uh, my lasting memory of the relationship between Goins and Jose Bautista is that ball that fell between them in Kansas City when one thought the other was calling and the other thought the other was calling and the ball dropped in. And that was a big moment. But God bless Ryan Goins and, and the Blue Jays ceremony uh, was outstanding. But if I can just mention, you mentioned you brought up Justin Smoke. 2019 was my first year working for the Blue Jays. So I was on the team bus every day on the road. And Justin Smoke, I felt for the first time, I believe that he had taken over the mantle of leadership that Jose Bautista had taught him how to do. Um, I just remember Smoke getting on the team bus every day. There's a bunch of young players. They were always looking out the window, where's Justin? Where's Justin? And they, the bus wasn't going to leave until Smokey got on. Then he would get on and just 
glide down the aisle, sit down. People would be asking him questions. He would just turn and respond. And, and there was one moment of leadership. And Brandon Drury was just reestablishing himself as a player. Uh, he was supposed to be like the type of Justin Smoke player that he was supposed to be. And it was the ninth inning. I was down in the uh, down in the tunnel behind the dugout waiting to help uh, with the television interview if if the Jays won. And Brandon Drury was asked to pinch hit down nine to eight against Tampa. He was going to pinch hit, and they were changing pitchers. They were bringing in uh, Pache. Yeah, the lefty. The lefty Pache. Yeah. And Brandon Drury came racing down the tunnel looking for Justin Smoke. Said, where's Smokey? Where's Smokey? And, and Smoke came out of the clubhouse. He wasn't in the lineup. He came out of the clubhouse, walked down the stairs. And Drury goes, Pache's coming in. What does he throw? What, what should I look for? And Smoke calmly said, well, he likes to start you off with a uh, high fastball. It's pretty flat. But... Yeah, that's that's what he starts out. First pitch, high fastball, pretty flat, and Drury hit it out to tie the game. <laughs> and, all. and I'm going, holy shit! That's that's the type of leadership that this team needs, and I, that I did not know that that Justin Smoke was like that. And uh, that moment stuck with me. I, I mentioned it to Smokey later on when when I was when he was leaving the team. I mentioned that to him. I said, are you going to be a hitting coach? Because I saw it and he smiled and he remembered. But it was such a moment of leadership. And to combine with everything else that I observed, he's one of the classy guys that I really, really liked. And I didn't as a player because we never really had to interview him. Right. I, I, I remember early in 2019 when Kevin Pillar was traded to the Giants. And we scrummed. Justin Smoke, uh, not in the clubhouse, but in the in the bowels there, in between the clubhouse, leading out to the dugout. And Smoke got emotional. And and I hadn't seen a player cry since Mark Burley after his start in Tampa Bay in June of 2013, when John Gibbons went into the clubhouse after that game to tell the team that Munanori Kawasaki was going back to AAA because Jose Reyes was going to be activated off what was then called the disabled list after that gruesome ankle injury that kept Jose Reyes out for most of the first half of 2013. And I, I thought it said a lot about Kawasaki at the time. Uh, there's Mark Burley, a perfect game thrower, a World Series champion with the 05 White Sox on a Blue Jays team that was badly underperforming and not living up to expectations, getting emotional for a teammate who at best on the field was a bit part utility guy. But with Justin Smoke, I mean, I saw what that was in the moment, which was here's the next piece from those 15 and 16 teams that I was a part of that I loved so much being sent away. And we knew that Marcus Stroman was going to be next by the trade deadline of 2019. And sure enough, he, he was in late July shipped off to the New York Mets, but I, I, I took it two part. Smokey loved Kevin Pillar brothers, teammates, but also that he was looking around going, man, there ain't many of us left. There ain't many of us left from from that wonderful time, and and that's what I thought. And 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 Smoke's wife, Kristen, very active. I don't know if she still is, but very active on Twitter. They very much became a part of the Toronto community, and we've talked a lot about Justin Smoke on Jose Bautista's tribute. But I think we allow for these digressions. But just the quality of of the people, and you know. Back to Jose, to me, you've got to react naturally. You know, if you cry, it's it's because you're feeling that emotion and that's how it comes out of you. If you don't cry, it doesn't mean you're not feeling that emotion. It's just that's not how you express it. The fact that Jose, who was an uber competitor, who was as meticulous in his preparation as anybody who could be pedantic 
if I'm being diplomatic with the media and all of that, the fact that he allowed himself to open up, he wore those sunglasses because he knew it was tough uh, or it would be tough. And when his wife, uh, Misha, paid tribute to him as part of the video tribute, wonderful stuff. I just I just thought the whole thing, man. And, well, you yeah, know, I just like it's just it was just a perfect tribute to an all time, all time great Blue Jay. And uh, a lot of people complain about when he was in that clubhouse and when he ascended to a leadership role, how he had changed. But I, I didn't see it as a change. I saw it as a, a, a style of leadership that Jose had. And, and other players notice that. I, I've seen leaders over the years in 50 years who seek the media. And, and it's, you know, all about them until it's not. And then it's about the team. And then when they say something about the team, it doesn't carry as much weight. But to me, the type of Jose Bautista leadership was that he didn't seek the media, but felt responsible to the media. And that's something that uh, his teammates and others in the clubhouse would notice. So any important matter, and we saw that in Oakland when he was standing in front of his locker to complain about umpires, he understood his leadership role he didn't necessarily like it. It wasn't natural to him, but he fulfilled it. And I think that's the type of leadership that created a situation where all those players and teammates and, and uh, people that worked with him flew in on Saturday to be a part of it. Yeah. And I, I, I think everybody, everybody who was announced received the response that they as individuals deserve. Uh oh, where are we going with this? No, I'm just, I, I, I'm talking about the roaring cheers for the people who were cheered roaringly. I'm talking about the indifference for those who were greeted with indifference and for those who were booed more than deserved. And, and it really was all about the good, the cheering, the warm feelings. And Griff, you know, I I got some Twitter replies. I got a lot of Twitter replies to to my post, and I ranked the top five Blue Jays for me personally. Yeah. And we talked about it on the show last week. And I rated the ceremony as a 19 out of 10. Obviously, right. a bit of a tacky tribute to Jose's <laughs> number, but it was that good. It was doubly as good as I think the base level expectation. It 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 really was. Um, awesome but a lot of people replied and said you know i teared up it brought back so many memories i don't feel the same way about today's group as i do that group now when i frame that i i want to say that we do have a tendency to go the nostalgic route things that happened in the past can be glorified a little bit more because, you know, we're, we're living in the now with the ups and downs of today's Toronto Blue Jays team. We're not living in the now of the disappointment of 2013 and the mediocrity of 2014 and then the trades in late July of 2015 that alleviated the mediocrity and turned the Blue Jays into an elite team that I think you and I both believe should have and could have won the World Series that year and would have won the world series against the New York Mets had they advanced past the Kansas city Royals. So I understand nostalgia. And I think there's a sort of a hearkening for our youth that's tied to nostalgia. We were younger then uh, our backs and our hips and our arms didn't hurt as much because we were younger people. Same is true for athletes who move on and retire and do other things. But I also think there is a legitimate desire to better embrace the current Blue Jays, but fans as badly as they want to. And as much as they may love some of the individual players currently playing for this team, they, they can't get themselves to fully wrap their arms around this group and the personality of this group. And I believe that 2015's team especially for people who are not old enough to remember the World Series years, but also including for people like you and me who do remember the World Series years, 
I think, I think fans just are not there yet with the 2021 to 2023 group that they were and are with the 2015, 16 group. Well, I would, I would argue that on August the 14th of 2015, that feeling that you're describing was not yet wrapping their arms, wrapping its arms around the fan base. I, I think they were, they were optimistic. They were like giddy with the addition of Troy Tulowitzki and, and David Price, but they weren't at the point where they were on Saturday when they embraced every member of that team who was introduced. I think on August the 14th of 2015, it might've been a similar feeling, but if somebody in this group, two or three people in this group step up and lead them to a spot in the postseason comparable to 2015, I think that there is a fan base, a group that will find a way to embrace the people that you describe as not the same in terms of uh, likability. I think that the 2015, 2016 teams were the first Blue Jays team for this generation of Blue Jays fans. And, and there's a few that go back to 92, 93, but that was a different generation. And, and like parents and grandparents are describing what they felt to their children and grandchildren, what they felt at that time. So 2015 to me was the first super team for this generation of fans and 2023 has not come close to that but still has a chance because it's august 14th you you don't believe that they might even you believe they might not even make the playoffs i believe they have a chance to win the division we, we talk about that every week but we'll see and i i agree that there is a huge difference in the 2015 feel and the 2023 feel but there's still a month and a half left. And, so and I, I'll know, give it, I'll give it a chance. You know, I know the 2015 team, especially after the July trades were littered with veterans who had significant resumes. The Jays had Bautista. They had Arden Carnacion. They had acquired Donaldson the previous off season. Tulowitzki comes in, David Price comes in. These are, these are people who had accomplished for years at the big league level already and and so it was no surprise that you could listen to Jose Bautista or Josh Donaldson or Encarnacion or any of those guys talk about hitting or David Price with his, if you don't like it, pitch better, which he had been talking about back to his Tampa Bay Rays days. But, you know, th those guys, the way that they talked about approach, the way that they talked about their swings, the way that we witnessed them take batting practice, et cetera, those were those were guys who had done it for a long time. I allow for the fact that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is still an absurdly young baseball player. Like a lot of players, Vladdy's age, are just breaking into the big leagues. They're not in season five of their major league careers. So I allow for that. Bo Bichette hurt right now, but and having a wonderful year, but 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 same deal. I, I just I watch this team. And sometimes, and I'm relatively rudimentary at this, like I've followed the sport, I've covered the sport, but I'll never profess to be a hitting coach or an expert. I don't think I'd qualify to coach the Oakville A's senior team like you do. Well, maybe I could give it a try. Oh, yeah, you could. <laughs> I could? That guy, that guy, that third base coach is uh, off uh, his yeah. rocker every now and oh, then? God, yeah. Um, and two guys thrown out in the first inning. The other day in our season finale at home, it was this, off, this, off. this feels like this feels like going to the men's league hockey game just to see the <laughs> fights. I want to go to these senior leg league Oakville A's games just to see the ejections. Yeah, you know at the pace that they seem to happen. The um, Cobas are next weekend. If you want to come back and go, I'll save you a seat. Be but finish up uh, where you but were my, going. But my <laughs> point, Griff. Yeah, my, you know, my my point is that what's I sit there a lot and I watch this team and I, with certain individuals in the lineup every day, I'm going, what's your plan when you step into the batter's box? What, what's the plan? What's the approach coming out of our ass on a first pitch slider that's down and away at toe level is not indicative of an approach. 
You know what I mean? I would, I would then counter with the, it's hard to wrap your arms around the personality of a team like the 23 Blue Jays whose talent lies mostly among guys who go out there every fifth day. They spent $78 million on the five man starting rotation. Fair the enough. one guy, the one guy that was embraceable at the start of the season was the opening day starter, Alec Manoa, who's no longer here. Now you've got five mercenaries on the mound and it's hard to wrap your arms around any of them, but that's where the money was spent. That's where the talent lies, the major league experience and talent lies and to me, that's what will get them to the postseason, whether you embrace them or not. We get, I know you do. I mean, if I do, you do, and others do. We get questions about the future of hitting coach Guillermo Martinez all the time. And my my thought on that is like wh why are you i know the yankees blasted their guy out at, at the all-star break but what's that going to change in mid-august that maybe the one thing it would change is the jays have like three other hitting coaches on the staff anyway but you know unless they go on a run which includes making the playoffs and having some offensive success in the playoffs when the pitching is better and even more specialized because managers are very quick with the hook and, and play the matchups as much as they can. Fair or not, Griff, and I, I don't know what's fair and what isn't, but Guillermo to me is out the door within a couple of days of the end of the season unless unless there's a turnaround here. That, I'm not saying it's fair. Yeah. I don't even know if it's fair or not. I'm saying he's out the door. That's quite possible. But I remember in 2020 when the uh, when the clubhouse was closed, when there was no media around, it was a half season, a short season because of the pandemic. And so we had Zoom calls. And we were in Buffalo. And I asked Guillermo to sit down and talk hitting on a Zoom call. And for 20 minutes – half hour it was a brilliant discussion of hitting of what they should be looking for of, of of technique of mechanics of this of that of of talking to vlad of getting him to uh, to to be a better hitter and i thought this guy really knows his hitting but whether you, as a fan you think he should be there or not whether you think guillermo should still be there or not the fact is, as you point out, there's three or four other guys and you hear players all the time saying, oh, well, I went to Don Mattingly and, and Don told me this. Or I went to Dave Hudgens. You see in the dugout guys talking to Dave Hudgens and not to Guillermo. So getting rid of Guillermo isn't going to change a hitter, who he goes to, who he believes in. Even uh, Santiago Espinal, when the team was in Tampa, got a couple of hits and said that, uh, that Dante Bichette helped him out because... They were in Tampa, so he went and he talked to him. So the presence of Guillermo Martinez as the hitting coach is not what's holding this offense down because they have other – it's not like he's the only hitting coach in the dugout, so you're stuck with him. There's something more to their slumping and to their inability to hit with runners in scoring position at key moments and the fact that that's what's dragging them down on that road trip to Cleveland where two rookie pitchers pitched seven shutout innings against them, allowing two hits. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's not Guillermo that, because they have four or five assets. But you know, so, Griff, there's a fall guy. I, I That's course, why I yeah. say, I don't know. Well, that's why I'm or. saying, that's why I'm agreeing with you that yeah. it wouldn't do anything to get rid of Guillermo right now, but I can see it happening immediately after the season. Like Dalton Varsho, who... I know is hitting a little better right now, but let's take the general view of this. And people are like, well, Dal Dalton Varsho stinks. I mean, very good defensive outfielder, but he stinks. And I'm like, actually go and look at his baseball reference page and look at his performance last year with the Arizona Diamondbacks. He had a better than 800 OPS as a left-handed hitter against right-handed pitchers, which is 
obviously the favorable platoon side, and because you see way more right-handers than you do left-handers, means a fair number of plate appearances over the course of the season for Dalton Varsho. But that 800-plus OPS against righties is heavily skewed slug. He was a 317, 31.7% on base guy against right-handed pitchers. He was well below 300 or 30% on base against left-handed pitchers. He's, then, he's th this idea that they traded for something and he's turned out to be the opposite of that offensively. He's been wonderful defensively. We know that, but this idea that we're somehow shocked by this and the idea that I think the front office is holding on to, which is Dalton Varsho is just going to unlock something next week. And he's a very young ball player still, only 26 years old, years of control. He can still evolve. He can still emerge. I don't deny that. But the idea that it's going to happen two-thirds to three-quarters of the way through the season right now that's going to turn him into an on-base machine, like you you have the player you acquired. Yeah, and, and The expectation, talk based on what they gave up, was that there was going to be something more there. Yeah, and you talked about the uh, the, the record with Arizona last year, and his diminished numbers against left-handed left-handed pitching also included the fact that, as we hear on television all the time, he had like twelve bunt hits against left-handers. So if that's a, a large part of his on-base percentage and batting average then you should have known what you were getting. And that's why I believe, well, not I believe, that's why at the trade deadline, the Blue Jays were looking for a right-handed bat who could supplement their lineup because the left-handers, Kiermaier and Dalton Varsho, uh, Kevin Bezio, the, the left-handers that they had, Brandon Belt, weren't playing against left-handers so they needed a right-hander and and they weren't aware of it because they were lending more to the credence to the development of Dalton Varsho and others than they've actually seen in 2023 and uh, I'm smiling Griff just as a general comment we were sitting here a week ago on the holiday Monday talking about Davis Schneider and the exciting and dominant yeah. sweep of, of the Some Boston of right of the Boston Red Sox. And, and I think this is getting back to the whole, the fans embracing this team and buying in and believing, well, what do they follow up that sweep with the Reds over the Red Sox with three out of four dropped in Cleveland to a team that can't hit. Well, that was two out of four. They could have won three oh, out of four. Yes. Uh, no, you're by right. winning that final game. They split that series, but it's yeah. a series that they needed to win three out of four and they had a chance. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and dropping two out of three to a Cubs team that I told you was good, but not great. A team that you want to beat or win the series against when, when you're at home. It's right. funny that they came back from Cleveland and on the weekend, nobody was talking about Davis Schneider and, and the fact that he sat a couple of games. Mm -hmm. Nobody was talking about him after what had happened in Boston. He had the time to come back to earth in Cleveland. And then by the time he was here, I mean, he may go back down when Bo is reinstated to the active roster. He may be the one to go back down because Santiago Espinal has showed that he can play shortstop, showed that he can play third base. And I think he woke up a little bit with his uh, his mental lapses that he had that that had us talking about him being sent to Buffalo on option. And Jose, Jose Bautista was in with Dan Schulman and Buck Martinez in the broadcast booth. And Espinal made that really nice play to his left and turn around and spun and fired a dart to first base and and jose made a point this kid's really good yeah you know and i i just I, I i thought you know there's jose sticking up for somebody a young player who's struggling to find his way has been through the yeah. ups and downs and um but you're right i i i just 
I rep- I will repeat the lazy cliche griff, which is that this team is what it is. Now they're double digits over 500. Yeah, that's that's you can't argue with that. They're like 12 games over as yeah. we speak, and they're going the next 23 games against teams that by and large are below 500 and that they should beat and they need to beat if they're going to fulfill my prediction of winning the division. And they still, yeah. (laughs) And they got to go out West again, but they got two. like you're going to Colorado and Oakland five and one, five and one, please. Right. Six and oh. And the only thing, the only thing that works against that prediction or that feeling is if any of those teams that have given up the ghost at the trade deadline wheel guys like Cleveland did back to back starting pitchers, young starting pitchers that the Jays haven't seen that throws 95, 96, and then mix change speeds. The Jays look lost against those guys. And those are the guys that you need to beat. So they're, they're going into a series or they're going into a stretch of games, 23 games starting with the Phillies on uh on wednesday on tuesday 23 games they need to be 15 and 8 because that last 19 games of the schedule is daunting it's texas and then intra-division in the ales so if they're not they're 12 over now if they're 15 and 8 in the next 23 that's 19 games over 500 they need to be 20 over to win 91 91 and 71 you can't expect them to have a tremendous record down the stretch against that schedule because all those other teams are trying to do the same thing that the Blue Jays are. Yeah, and so I, they need to they need to make hay in those series that they should win. They must win. And the, I mean, the Yankees are not very good, relatively speaking, although they are above five hundred and are getting roasted in the papers if that's still a term we can use uh, every day since the trade deadline and Griff, we're, we're going to steer clear of the nitty gritty of this until more information comes out. But Wander Franco didn't play for Tampa Bay yesterday and against Cleveland and apparently was not on their flight out West. And that's because some social media stuff came up on, are we calling it X now? Is is that? Uh, let's call it Twitter. Yeah, on on Twitter, and the rumor is that there is a teenaged, underaged girl alleging uh, a relationship with him, and he and the the Rays are taking it seriously. We've got to let this play out, and yeah, the and we don't know the details. But what I'm saying is, is if is if he's not there. The Rays have been a middling team for a couple of months now. Yeah, and they've lost Shane McClanahan since then. So. Right. So if 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 he's not there because this thing, uh, there's something to it, or there's even more to it than we know right now, I I would like that. To me, that will be the litmus test for this team. Will be how you perform against vulnerable divisional opponents who have more or less taken care of you when they've played you so far this season. Yeah. I mean, the Yankees, the Rays, the Orioles is, is a different story because they're young and improving, but I've always, you know, I continue to say that their young rotation, I think they've got three out of five guys in the rotation who are really close to their innings, uh, career innings high. And we know how that, you know, you may not think it should affect young pitchers that way, but it does. And uh, they they got Jack Flaherty and they got Kyle Gibson uh, and they got a bullpen that will be overworked in the next month and a, a, and a half. So, you know, that there's nothing personnel wise to work against the Orioles, but there is youth and and experience wise going down the stretch so we'll see i mean and i i think that the jays pitching staff is in far better shape than any anyone else in the al east because of the the four the money they spent on their top four starters and ryu bouncing back if he if he can stay healthy uh and the bullpen is as deep as it's been going into september that in any season that i can remember so 
Yeah, so the, I mean, they do have a chance in those last nineteen games, but I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't bet that they'll go better than ten and nine. I think ten and nine would be pretty, pretty outstanding over that stretch. So they need to be nineteen over already going into that final uh, nineteen games. I'm just I'm looking up into my right here, Griff, at at the ring light, which is lighting me. It's kind of like a halo of God here, like an angelic <laughs> thing, and I'm. I'm listening to you and I'm like, I think this is Griff trying to speak his Orioles theory into yeah. reality here. Yeah. You, the, it the, hasn't the Jays, started to happen yet, but the it's Jays could be the Jays could be 10 back of the Orioles with nine games to play. <laughs> and you are going to be, I'll tell you what that bullpen's done. And those starting pitchers are past their innings limits, and the Jays could just go nine and zero, and the Orioles go zero and nine, and the and math. The, I'm going to make the math work. In those last nine games, that have to hit a wall harder than Ayrton and Senna. That's all I know. Oh boy! All right. Too soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been about thirty years, is it? Yeah, when, yeah. That, when, when, not... when does what? What's the? What's the? What's the? What's the barrier? Statute of, statute of my limitations. Yeah. Yeah. We could have a Seinfeld conversation. What's the statue of limitations on that? I believe it's statute. Statute. <laughs> not statue. Statute. How about Chad Green, by the way? Yeah. I mean, on the list of ways you can get hurt, that has to be way down. Tyler Heineman, the Buffalo Bisons catcher, we know him because he's you know, had cups of coffees with the Blue Jays a handful of times in the last year and a half or so. Tyler Heineman trying to throw out a would-be base stealer. Chad Green turns his back but doesn't squat, doesn't duck. And Heineman's throw dings off the back of Green's head, and he's now in the concussion protocol, which will push back his arrival to Toronto. Not in the plans, Griff. That's not yeah. how they were drawing it up. No, that's unbelievable. And, uh, you know, just to watch the video and just see him turn and not get down. Like, he's been he's been out of the game for a year, but you know when a guy's stealing second and a catcher's throwing through, yeah, get yeah. down or get off, one of the two. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he got hit. It's It was ugly and it was cringeworthy. And uh, I hope that he does – come back soon but the major league baseball is serious about concussion protocol they got to make sure in various ways that he clears before he gets a chance to come back but luckily that the blue jays bullpen is nine deep in an eight-man pen so he you know when he's ready it might be by the time that they expand by by one pitcher in September, they go up to 28. But I have another interesting uh, conspiracy theory. This yeah, okay. So is this is this is this the Hagen Danner uh, Hagen Danner experience? conspiracy theory? Yes, okay. because they sent Nate Pearson down to the minor leagues, and you can't bring a guy back for 10 days if you option him out. So. When there's a chance they have Manoa going back, they bring Hagen Danner up to be the extra bullpen guy. So the first inning, the first batter he gets out, the second batter on the first day he's back, he pulls an oblique, or so they say. So he pulls an oblique, he's injured. Now you can bring Pearson up because you have an injury. He couldn't come up for 10 days unless there was an injury. Now, Hagen Danner, how about Hagen? And, and like, I have nothing to back this up, but I'm a conspiracy theory from 1963 on. Griffin on. November this is 27. a Griffin on moment. Yeah. So, like, Hagen, if you go on the IL, you get major league salary the rest of the year because you're hurt. So how about when you go out there, we won't, say anything and we would how about if you pull an oblique or a back or something that's hard to check and then uh and then you get major league salary and we can bring nate up and bob's your uncle and but, then when you get back to the clubhouse we'll just wheel you into one of the x-ray rooms pull out a kidney so you have a legitimate injury <laughs> and then okay anyway so, so i i don't want to create a situation here but i just crossed my mind because 
uh, I do not think that uh, that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. All right. So you weren't wearing like a bear suit on January 6th at the U.S. Capitol, Griffin on, right? Like you weren't you weren't cosplaying fascism. You, you're not one of those conspiracy theorists, but you're but you think Hagen Danner may have a fake pulled oblique. So I'm going to. It fits my scenario. I'm going to turn the screws on you here, Griff, because you of your of your 50 years in baseball, half of them, you had access behind the scenes, mostly with the Expos and then for four years with the Blue Jays, 2019 to 2022. Have you seen or have you borne witness to bullshit? Like, ah, you know, you got a bit of a hangnail there. We got to IL you. Like quite often, but the most interesting one was uh, when in the 22 inning game against the Dodgers at uh, Olympic Stadium, when uh, John Wetland pitched for the Dodgers and pitched five innings and 22 innings, and Larry Walker left third early and blah, blah, blah. He got to the last inning and uh, there was nobody left in the bullpen. Joe Hesketh said that he wasn't feeling 100%. So the, the the little lefty didn't come in, which left Dennis Martinez, who had pitched two days before to put his spikes on and come in and throw a pitch that Rick Dempsey hit for a home run to end the game. The next day we were flying to the West Coast. It was a travel day. Next day we're flying to San Diego and Joe Hesketh shows up in a cab with his suitcase and everything. And uh, John Silverman, the equipment guy, meets him at the sidewalk in front of uh, in front of Dorval Airport and says, Joe, get back in the cab. You're not coming to the West Coast. You are on the disabled list. And we don't know what the problem was, but his refusal to pitch in that 22nd inning to suck it up and, and throw an inning. Uh, we're not sure whether he was hurt, but that's an example of what can happen using baseball's rules? Joe Hesketh from Lackawanna, New York. I remember that name, but I'm telling you right now, Griff, if it had never been spoken by another human again, I would never have dug it out of my own brain. He balked before he threw his first major league pitch. Okay. First left-hander went up. They said his foot went behind the rubber and he had to throw to the plate. He threw the first balk had not thrown a pitch yet. Joe Hesketh. I'm still stuck on I'm still stuck on the name. He's a great golfer, three handicap. I think he's a pitching coach for the uh class A Erie team in Erie, Pennsylvania. Like to, today. Yes. Right now. Yes. Wow. Okay. Well, hopefully that well, injury is all healed. of a sudden you're overwhelmed with Joe Hesketh. I just I no, but it's that is a name I and I'm always looking for names for Immaculate Grid. Oh God, I don't. I don't even know where he played after that. So getting you the uh, the, the yeah. cross reference would be tough. By the way, do you play Immaculate Grid? Did we talk about this last week? I'm not sure. We didn't talk about it on the show. On, so this thing the- is like heroin for me now. Like I can't. I need. I play it every day, and I leave it if I haven't finished it, and I come back to it later, and. Sometimes names don't come to me and then they do and all of that. I, I can't get enough of this thing. What I want to know Griff is if I can use uh, Montreal Expos for Washington nationals players. Yes. I have, I have, there are people in the press box who are in the same boat as you. They're, they're addicted to it. And they have told me indeed you can. So if, if, if I ever get a cross reference, Seattle Mariners or LA angels, Washington Nationals, I can go with Mark Langston. Right. But you want to be more obscure than that, don't you? I mean, to score uh, bonus points, I believe. But who the hell is going to, who the hell is going to piece Mark Langston together when they see the Nationals logo? Oh, they need brilliant that. people like you and me. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be about 8% right there. Yeah. yeah. I would have gone Gene Harris. Was, okay. Was Gene Harris the one who threw both? Was he the Pat Venditti no, no. or was that? That was Greg, Greg Harris. Greg yeah. Harris. Gene Harris, okay. Gene Harris was a defensive back from Tulane. Very athletic, included in the Mark Langston, Randy Johnson deal. And he never really became anything. Should have stuck to football, I think. Should have stuck to football. 
All right. Well, we got the Philadelphia a lot today. We certainly did. I mean, we learned that the Jays are what they are. Now the Phillies are coming in. Yeah. Right. And they're, they've got a couple of good starters going, but the Jays have good starters every day now. They do. They just need to shout out to Ryu, man. Like, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It is never going to be sexy and it's never going to be high velocity, but it wasn't high velocity before the elbow went. He's just, I know he gave up a couple early to the Cubs, but then he settled right down. The Jays got the five spot and, and took the lead and never looked back to salvage a game in that series. And, you know, Hyunjin Ryu is a more trusted starting pitcher right now for this team than Alec Manoa. Yeah, and there's a conundrum going into September in terms of if Alec Manoa is ever going to get back in the rotation or even when they go to a four-man rotation in the playoffs. Do you take Ryu out of the rotation? But you can't because I have been there for 2021. 20, I've been there for three of Ryu's years. And it takes him at least 18 hours to get ready to start because he starts with his personal massage therapist the day before. Then he goes and watches video. Then he gets stretched out again. Then he gets oiled up. Then he, so he can't pitch in relief. There's no way that Hinjin Ryu can pitch for this team in relief unless you know a guy is going to struggle 23 hours earlier and you're getting him to come in. And the Kikuchi would have been, Kikuchi would have been the obvious choice because he's done it before. Bring him in, get have him get more than three outs, but he's pitching so well as a starter, you can't take him out because he's better than Bassett and the lately than Gosman. So like that is a problem is who do you take out of that rotation when they win the division and go to the postseason? Well, you'll have four or five days to make that decision since they'll just be sitting around watching the wildcard teams play for the right to come to Toronto, right? I mean, the way it's all just will that into existence, Griff, make make that happen. Well, the, I believe you. I believe you. I'm buying in. If that does happen, then our earlier conversation about the beloved 2015 Blue Jays there will be an equivalency factor in 2023 in terms of who becomes the equivalent of the 15 in terms of fan love. We haven't seen it yet. I can't even guess. I'm I'm thinking Bo and maybe Springer if he steps up or Kiermaier, but Kiermaier is sort of like an iffy offensive player. But Somebody will if they're gonna if they're gonna win the division. Somebody will have to step up offensively and become the Jose Bautista of 2023. Who's gonna win the Marco Estrada Award for guy they picked up? I know that was the Adam Lynn trade, but guy they picked up from somewhere else, pretty nondescript, who becomes a cult hero. Could it be Kikuchi? I who knows. I, I do believe that that's a good call. I mean. You had R.A. Dickey, and, and when he was signed, it was the biggest signing, and, and I think it created a new generation, a new anticipation. And when R.A. Dickey was acquired from the Mets, Las Vegas bought into it because they installed the 2013 Blue Jays as the World Series favorites, and we know how that worked out. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, when I think of R.A., it's kind of like the entirety of my life, Griff. It, it, it took longer than it should have for me to acknowledge that I love Dickie. But <laughs> oh, God. that is so bad. That's so bad. <laughs> Griff's feeling uncomfortable in his workplace nah, no. <laughs> right now. Um, but like but I remember two mile an hour Dickie fastball. That's what. <laughs> that's how uncomfortable. It is. <laughs> right, right down the plate. Oh my god! But but I, uh, R A and I, I would I always I efforted to borrow a an R A word, um, if I could conversate with you for a moment to borrow another R A word. I efforted to to get to know the man, 
And we really didn't actually click until I would say June of 2014. So it took a year and a bit. But I remember we were in Minnesota. You tell me if you were on the trip. You wouldn't forget it if you were because it was below <laughs> freezing in April of 2014. So the Jays were there early that season and it was cold and there was snow on the ground and the second game of the series, which was to be a night game, got snowed out. So that led to a doubleheader the next day and RA who was scheduled to pitch the game that got banged opens up the doubleheader. And I asked him the day before in the clubhouse after the, after it was announced that, the game wasn't going to be played that night. So he was pitching tomorrow. I said, RA, do you, uh, d do you have the ability to grip your knuckleball when the tips of your fingers are numb and all that? And I believe that I possess the abilities to get the job done. And he was very dismissive in the way that he said that to me. And then he went out and pitched like four and a third innings or whatever it was and gave up a ton of hits and a ton of runs and couldn't feel his fingers. And I'm standing there going, it really wasn't that stupid a question. I mean, uh, I'm not holding it against you that you throw a pitch that requires you to have feeling at the end of your fingers. <laughs> and it's below freezing in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I believe that I possess Gregor. I could, I could just, I could start that sentence and Gregor Chisholm would just start laughing. I believe that uh, I, I believe that I was there, but I have two RA Dickey stories that, that are my personal memories of, of RA. And I, I love the guy. So and I, I. Think he was, I think he was yeah. undervalued as a, as a 200 plus inning 12. You know inning. why Griff? Because everybody watched Noah Syndergaard yeah. pour it up with the with the nine Mets for two or three years, right? Throwing yeah. ninety eight and all that. That that's what it was. That's that's what it was. So the first of my two incidents with RA was uh, after his first start at Rogers Center with the roof closed, and he gave up three home runs or whatever it was in on opening day. And the next day he comes and he goes, Richard. Does the ball always carry like that with the roof closed? <laughs> and I'm thinking he's blaming the roof closed for three shitty knuckleballs. <laughs> Could you open the roof on April the 8th, please? But and the other one was he had as you remember, he was just coming to the Blue Jays off of publishing a book, off of writing, and, and the book was coming out as he arrived with the Blue Jays. And one of the anecdotes, one of the powerful stories in there was him discovering himself as a minor leaguer where he took off all his clothes and down to his underwear and he tried to swim across the mighty Missouri River and was carried downstream about halfway across. And one of his teammates walked in and Grant Belfort. Grant Belfort, Grant right? Belfort dragged him out of the Missouri onto the banks and he had an epiphany of like this is who i am this is not who i am this is what i should not be and so we went to oakland to cover the series so i'm i'm saving this call this is going to be a great call i'm, I'm going to talk to grant balfour about the experience and and get the reaction on the other side i go in he's not there grant balfour is not there the next day i go in he is there and i go over introduce myself he had no memory of that incident at all. And I'm going like, I guess this column, I got to think of something else right now because this is not going to work. <laughs> but I don't know what that meant. Was it not how R.A. described it? Did like, were his lungs so full of water that he was hallucinating? Griff, I'm going to tell you right now, unless it's early onset dementia for Grant Belfour, if you or me or anybody jumped into the mighty Mississippi to save a teammate, a friend, a family member, whatever, we'd remember doing it. Oh, whew. so I'm, it wasn't me. I, I'm just throwing it out there as a high possibility that you would remember being a lifesaver. I remember walking into Jack Stack Barbecue in Kansas City's famous or occasionally infamous 
country club plaza area which is the downtown part that's full of restaurants bars clubs and all that a lot of fun and ra's 60 minutes interview was oh, yeah. on the tv walking into that restaurant so i think it was the sunday night at the end of that jay's royal series the first road trip of 2013 and i'm sure that when they did that interview he was still a new york met and there was going to be a lot of the whole New York. He'd won the Cy Young and written the book. I, I don't know. I, I think R.A. really grew to love his time in Toronto. I, I don't believe he was BSing when when he when he said that he did. But I don't know in terms of his individual profile and some of the work he was doing, the writing of the book, the climbing of Kilimanjaro, and 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 those other things. I don't know if he foresaw during his 2012 Cy Young winning season that he would ultimately be traded to Toronto, which of course is not a small city, but is not an American city and is not considered by Americans to be a major metropolis, even though it is. To counter that, I would suggest that he did know because in December, the day that the day before it was announced that he was being acquired by the Blue Jays, I called Alex Anthopoulos and I said, hey, you know, this crazy story about R.A. Dickey coming to the uh, uh, being acquired by the Jays. Is, is there anything to it? And he said, it's funny you should ask, because I am just leaving R.A. Dickey's house on my way to the airport in Nashville. And I went, what? He said, yeah, you got the first uh, scoop on this. I called him to say, hey, you know, it's Alex Anthopoulos. Um, can we talk about? And he said, yeah, yeah, we can talk. When do you want to talk? And he said, and and Alex said, can we come to your house? And he go, yeah, well, next couple of days. He said, no, we're we're ten minutes away. They were already in Nashville. Okay. They went over to the house, sat in his living room, convinced him that Toronto was the place to be, and that they were headed in the right direction. They had just made the. The uh, Miami deal, less than a month earlier, Gibby had been hired. And so he knew 100% because he had to approve the deal. So, no, but I was talking more about when he was writing the book and during oh, the when he was writing season the and preparing but the whole sit for across, sit. Did it come across in the 60 Minutes interview that he was a little disappointed to where he was going? No, 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 no. It was just, oh. I mean, for all I knew he might have given that interview months prior, like he yeah. might have still been a Met, right? But they were detailing his baseball career to that point. And I, if I recall correctly, tacked the Toronto element and the trade on it at the end. Um, well, I mean, I, at that point, the Blue Jays were irrelevant, had been since oh, yeah. the World Series years. Oh, Blue yeah. Jays were irrelevant. I just remember, I remember, I can't remember who tweeted it, but I remember the tweet and whether it was John Heyman or Jeff Passan would have been a really young reporter then, whoever it was, Jays and Marlins working on a deal. Basically anybody making any money with Miami is headed to Toronto. Yeah. And I remember looking at that going, are you kidding? And because it just hadn't happened, right? We were used to the Blue Jays being a feeder system like other yeah. teams for the Yankees and Red Sox for a decade and a half. So when that happened, it was huge. Where Dickie and I ended up connecting, Griff, you remember May of 2014, Juan Francisco was the reincarnation of Babe Ruth and the team went on that epic run and then they came home in early June and the Cardinals came to town and Jaime Garcia shoved it up their asses and the downfall began. And then people just started throwing Juan Fan Francisco breaking balls. And yeah, you know, but I remember talking to Dickie before the Cardinal series at his locker and we we're just shooting the shit off the record, just having a chat. And I happened to mention that I was at the Joe Carter home run game as a 14 year old in 1993. And his eyes lit up because he, he remembers that game. He talked about that when he was acquired by the Jays. And part of the conversation ended up me saying to him, because they had had such a strong May and were playing so well and things look so good. I said, you 
will see a side of this city that you can't even imagine right now if you guys see this through. And obviously they didn't that year. Yeah, 2015 came and I remember having a quick sort of blow by with him in September of 2015. He was clearly headed to the trainer's room or something so we couldn't stop and chat. But I remember just saying, you remember what I said 15 months ago? And he looked at me like, what, what do you mean? And I, I said, you're seeing it, aren't you? And he's like, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And so everybody fell in love with the team again. Cool. Cause the team earned people's love. To come full circle on this episode of exit philosophy, we bring, come back to Jose Bautista mm. and Jose Bautista with the 54 home run season and, and the way he had played through the first half of that decade was a Canadian hero, sports hero from coast to coast. But with that bat flip, he became an international sports figure, pro or con. You either liked what he did or you hated what he did, but it made the Blue Jays and what they were doing relevant again. I mean, they could have won that series and nobody would still have been paying attention. But the bat flip, and from that moment on, every time somebody flipped a bat, they would refer to Jose Bautista and his tremendous first effort at a bat flip in, in one of the biggest games of his career. And, and so there's the importance of Jose Bautista and him being feted at the stadium on Saturday is that he, he became more than just a national Canadian sports icon. He became an international icon for good and bad and, and, that made his career and his reputation. And that's where we stand right now. And, and it was or the bat flip was organic. I said yeah. it last week. I'll repeat it now. That was real emotion in a really emotional moment. The context being deciding game of a playoff series, but also the most intense inning of baseball you or I have ever witnessed Griff with some weird things happening, the way that the Rangers took the lead in the top of the seventh, that place, the, the Rogers center, the sky, I'll always call it sky dome was a tinderbox. And I remember turning to Dave Naylor in the seventh inning stretch. My colleague at TSN was sitting beside me that day. And I turned to Dave Naylor and I said, Dave, if the blue Jays lose this game three to two, we're going to have to find some cots and sleep in this stadium because it ain't going to be safe to go outside. And Toronto's not a riotous city, but people, I, you could, there was a buzz. There was yeah. a, 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 an electric current in that stadium. And then when how, Jose hit the home run, it just blew the lid off the yeah. place. And that, that's the context that people don't understand when they just see the swing and the flip. They don't understand the intensity of that inning of Russell Martin throwing the ball off the hitter's bat and the run Ooh, scoring yeah. and the umpire spreading his arms, like calling timeout. Before the guy crossed the plate, he called time. And, and once that happens, right or wrong, normally the rule is that the guy goes back to the base and you say, hey, I'm sorry, I made And they let him score. And I, as you turn to Dave Naylor, I turned to Rosie, Rosie DeMano and I said, Rosie, don't start writing yet because the baseball gods will not allow this game to end this way. Yeah. And when he hit the home run, she looked at me and I looked at her and we started writing our game over. Blue Jays win, Blue Jays win. Amazing. It was, yeah. Um, it was just, yeah, it was, it was a wild and, and crazy game. It was a crazy series and funny. It was Rugnet Odor who came down the third base line and scored that run when Russell Martin uh, threw that or attempted to throw that ball back to Aaron Sanchez and it hit Shinsu Chu's bat. I actually hosted because Dale Scott, the now retired home plate umpire in that game was doing a book tour last summer and he swung through Toronto and I hosted his Toronto event. And I I've got a paraphrase here, Griff. I wish I remembered it better, but Dale, Dale cops to ha screwing up by throwing his arms up and calling time. <laughs> but he tells the best John Gibbons story because he's a Gibby. Nobody knew what was going on, right? 
So he says, Gibby kind of comes out and he's like, Dale, like, what, what the hell is this? You threw up time. And I got it wrong, Gibby. Well, what's the rule? And he, Dale said, I explains the rule. And, go, and he, he said something to the effect of Gibby goes, well, I don't like that rule. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that rule. What are you talking about? It's just because Gibby really had no comeback. No, you know, because it, what, was, it was what it was. It was what it was. It explains that the rule would have allowed him to score. Then, when they allowed him to score, there's not much you can say about it. But I don't like that all rule. time. All right, <laughs> change the rule. Come on, Dale. <laughs> My favorite Gibby line from that moment was when he was arguing with the umpire, and a, a beer can flew by his ear and almost clocked him in the head. And in, in the post game, he said. Uh, you know, uh, I, I thought it may have been Beast in throwing that, but it was full, <laughs> which which just cracked everyone up. Classic, classic. Like, do you remember Edwin, who was obviously on deck hitting behind Jose, waving his arms, telling the crowd to stop, yeah, throwing shit, but the Texas Rangers misinterpreting that as Edwin rubbing it in and celebrating yeah. like it, the whole Dyson, Sam Dyson walked right to home plate as Edwin was doing that Edwin had his back to him and, and Dyson said something to him that clearly didn't sit well with Edwin and he turned and that's when they went nose to nose and the dugouts cleared and that was a tremendous that that's oh. why the 23 team is having trouble living up to the memories of the 15. Well, and I'm just thinking like who would win a tag team fight to the death cage match jose bautista and edwin encarnacion versus sam dyson and rugnit odor yeah well rugnit yeah. If, if it was face to face and and everyone expecting it rugnit was it would would have been in trouble yeah and it turned out sam dyson was a wonderful human sarcastically <laughs> speaking yeah. after all was said and done but great memories and a wonderful wonderful tribute to jose and just even in the, as we wrap it up here, Griff, the new look stadium with, with the Renos and all that, the names on the level of excellence, it's just, it's a really sharp look. Yeah. And it's, it's just so well done. I, you know, yeah, it was, uh, the, over the course of time, I've never been impressed with the Blue Jays ceremonies. This was the first time that, and they, they just leaped over other stadiums and other ceremonies and it was tremendous and they did a great job yeah and uh for a an individual in jose bautista who was deserving and even more so of the honor and the tribute bestowed upon him so we'll be back at it next monday and uh maybe the jays will be on a roll and prove me wrong maybe maybe their run of winning 15 of 21 games has begun griff i'm i am eagerly awaiting i am you are manifesting it and i am sitting back skeptical and i am more than happy for you to be right when well all is said and done they have two off days coming up this week between now and our next exit philosophy and maybe they can think about who they want to go to for hitting advice and maybe that will help <laughs> we'll find out remember griffsthepitch.com is Griff's personal page. Uh, you can log on there and subscribe. You get multiple weekly Blue Jays and MLB columns. You get a weekly MLB power rankings column. And with about six, seven weeks left in the regular season, those become even more interesting and intriguing at this crucial time of year as we head into the stretch drive. You get exclusive conversations with some of the current and former greats of the game, Blue Jays and former Montreal Expos. And you get the exit philosophy podcast have yourselves a wonderful week keep enjoying the summer and we'll be back one week from now on august the 21st thanks scotty that was fun thanks everyone